Welcome back to the Fly Culture Podcast, your weekly look inside the world of fly fishing presented by Pete Tigers. If you're enjoying listening, please consider subscribing. In the latest episode of the Fly Culture Podcast, I talk with April Vokey about her career in fishing, the highs and lows, and what goes into making a success in a difficult to navigate industry. We were supposed to talk about her life in 10 fly rods, but we let the conversation flow in whatever direction it took. I hope you enjoy this one. Hey, April, it's great to have you on the Fly Culture Podcast. How are you doing? I'm awesome. How are you? Very well indeed. It must be very good for you being the other side of the mic and not having to ask the questions for a change. I think it's easier being behind the mic asking the questions, actually. (laughs) At least that way I don't say something stupid. I have this problem where I tend to speak before I think. And so with, with questions, I can hide behind those. Um, so hopefully I can, I can behave myself in this interview. We're, I'll try my utmost. I, I usually get things wrong and I've got the questions as well. So I'll, I'll do my utmost to be as professional as, as possible. But like I say, it's great to have you along here. And where are you right now for our listeners so they can get a sense of where you are? And I know you've been traveling a little bit at long last as well, but where are you based right now? Yeah, so I just spent the past month in Canada, which is my home country. And now we are back in, oh, we're about half hour out of Sydney, Australia. So getting used to the climate here, it was really cold in Canada. Like unseasonably cold. I don't know if it's like that where you are, but the last week of December, first week of January was honestly miserable. And I feel horrible because I said to Charles and my daughter, I was like, we're on the coast. It doesn't get that cold. You'll be fine. And I mean, they're looking at me going, we could die out here. What are you talking about? It was freezing. Yeah. I I know I fished out um, on your home river actually, and that was only in October and wading into the Bulkley for the first time there was quite a sharp intake of breath because I was surprised how cold that water is. And I spend a lot of my time wading in rivers and that caught me by surprise. So heaven knows what um, January must or December and January must have been like. Did you manage to get to fish? Well, so we were in Chilliwack. That's where we were based out of, which is about uh, an hour out of Vancouver. But then of the month, we took two weeks and we flew up north to the Bulkley. And we did fish, but we were ice fishing in in the lake. The river, actually, I'll post a, I should post a little video about it on my social media. I took a video of the river because my property is on the Bulkley. And so I walked down the boat ramp and couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was just piles upon piles of ice, like six feet tall where the river is. It was, it was really stunning to see. But it's funny, when I bought my place, I had been warned about flooding, but not from rain, rather from ice pack coming in. So what will happen is the river will get so stacked up with ice that it will push onto the property. And then, of course, when that melts, that's when you can have a potential flooding disaster. So um, I've been up there before at that time of year, but not with a family. So it was a little different because we're trying to make sure a four-year-old doesn't get frostbite. But look, we had a great time. I think that the weather, the, the cold there is different than the coastal cold. And I know you'll hear people say, oh, you know, the wet cold is different to the dry cold, but it really is a major difference between just how it impacts you. Wow. Wow. And and do you have then, if you're in Australia, when you're over in Australia, do you have someone looking after or keeping an eye on your property, making sure everything's okay and, and you don't get damage like that coming through? Yeah, we have the best neighbors. They're my second mom and dad and Paul and Patty, they're just the best. And so they make sure nothing too crazy happens. There's always a little, every year there is some drama (laughs) that happens and it doesn't always have to do with the cabin. I mean, one time it was the cabin. We had a, an ice storm take down our, um, wall tent at the time. I had this really cool wall tent up for a few years and an ice storm took that down. And then, um, this year, actually it was a, a bear. We had a real problem bear that was, that was, um, that was hiding out at our place. And, um, so of course that was something that the neighbors had to, to pitch in to take care of. So there's always something interesting that happens when we're out of town. 
Yeah, that sounds pretty interesting. I know in the UK, we're not going to have issues with bears and probably stacked up rivers like that as well. So yeah, it's kind of puts things in perspective a little bit. Is it a dangerous road for me to go down with you with Steelhead? Because I know my home river, you know, we're looking at the um, returns for the whole river. And my guess is for the little river that I fish, the total river is going to be something in the region of salmon of about 120 to 150. Our sea trout, our equivalent of steelhead, um, are going to be about half of what the salmon are going to be. Um, is it, I'm, I'm sensing it's a similar sort of case on the reading about the Skeena system and everything else. It's a, a deep worry for yourselves as well, isn't it? Yeah. Look, I, I'm, I'm obviously not the best person to provide science, any science here. I'm, I'm totally out of my league with this sort of conversation, but looking at the numbers from 2021, they were well below anything we've seen before. So I know that there's always conversation around this and there's always debates, but the science that is right in front of us is showing that it's not looking great. It has been the last couple of years. Who knows if it'll go back up, but I think it's a pretty safe bet that fisheries around the world are probably feeling some pressure. Do you think though that nature given perhaps a helping hand or can it heal itself? And do you think that there is potential? And I know in the, the, the North America that, you know, they're very quick to shut rivers and, and make those changes. Do you think this is something potentially, I know we've got a background of global warming as well, but do you think it's something that nature can look, given half a chance, make some sort of a go at things? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I could probably fill the space with a bunch of thoughts and ideas, but the short answer is I have no idea. I would mm. like to think so. Uh, how we go about doing that, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? Uh, uh, well, I I think it's going to be a tricky one. I think the global warming issue is going to be a problem. What we've had issues with is pollution in rivers, um, farming practices and other issues like those. Now we've really, as an angler, and we don't have, we do have things like Trout Unlimited, um, but not the political clout that they have. But it's taken anglers and other bands, surfers, kayakers to band together a little bit more and highlight it to the wider public and they're starting to be engaged about these things and of course salmon farms as well so we're 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 talking about those issues as well now so um i think that's coming into the wider public's domain which i think is a key thing there are people um like fergal sharkey i don't know if you know fergal who's a, a pop star in the 70s and 80s with the undertones a punk band and he's just grabbed it by the scruff of the neck and is really going after the environment agency over here and highlighting and having a high profile profile person like that I think has done us so much good and leapt us on I was at the stage and I've talked on this podcast before about taking less polite action and perhaps starting to turn up at water companies for their constant um, pollution and picketing them almost and being a little bit more um less friendly, I think, without being aggressive, but being more um, in front of them and making them aware. But I think particularly people like Fergal, the work that they're doing, I think, is is helping. Is it, is it fixable? I'm like you. I'm not 100% sure. But I think nature's very smart at figuring stuff out. And given half a chance, my fingers are tightly crossed. So, yeah, we'll see. We're all looking at these issues right now, and they, they are continue and will continue to be a worry, won't they? I think so. I mean, I would love to know where a great place to start is. I've got – it feels like every day there's a different solution. So um, if you have any suggestions of, you know, of, of, of ways people can get started, I'd love to, to hear them. Is it the water companies? I mean, is that who we put the pressure on? Is who do you start to put to to be less polite with? Well, certainly Obviously the water companies. Oh, no, sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah, I was going to say, you know, one of the issues with the water companies is that we have an, an apologies to listeners because they know I bang on about this a lot, but they have an infrastructure which is old. We have a small country with a need for more homes. And so what they will do is not invest in their infrastructure. They will pollute the rivers and discharge sewage into the rivers and pay the fines as part of their operating costs. So that's got to change. The fines are gradually getting a little bit higher as well. Um, so I think that's starting, as I say, to come into the wider public domain. And a lot of the newspapers are on this story now, almost daily right now, which is great. And this is, you know, I'm sure we, I don't really want to go down the social media route, but this is one of the great things about it that we can highlight it to many people and so that's been one of the issues some of the crops like maize that we have over here is a late um, harvested one that leaves the soil loose the soil gets um, uh, runs into the river silt in the river uh, those sorts of things and of course the salmon farms as well and I'm starting to see stories about closed um salmon farms now which may kind of help and it's whether these companies decide they want to invest in that so i think it's a multitude of different things that we're looking at but trying our utmost to push all of them right now i think yeah yeah when you say water are you talking what kind of you have to excuse my ignorance here but what kind of water are you talking factories sewage sewage okay yeah so it's sewage farms, and as I said, they get overfilled, and it's released into the rivers, um, and it's pretty unpleasant. Mm. There's got to be a way to reuse that. I mean, I've been to Sri Lanka and have seen them do spectacular water recycling, and and honestly, don't they have fields? And this is obviously again me way out of my league here, but don't they have beautiful fields of? crops and grass that are fed by septic water i thought that i'd seen something about that farmers keep septic tanks and will put stuff onto um their fields and stuff but the issue is is like i was saying that the problem is is with these sewage treatment works they are at capacity and so yes they should and they could invest And like you say, bring things up to date, but they're not doing that. They don't want to do that. They're beholden to shareholders. And so their biggest issue really is revenue and bottom line. And so as long as they can keep saying, right, we're going to keep polluting the river, we'll keep polluting the river, and we'll just pay the fine as part of our operating costs, we'll do it. That what it takes is someone like the Environment Agency to make those fines substantially bigger so that they say, well, actually, there's no point. We need to invest now in in the infrastructure. And I think that's where we're going to have to get close to before too long, which is hopefully good news. Yeah, or find a better consequence. That's just a, that's just a, an expense that they can use as a tax write-off. Yeah. Um, all yeah. right, interesting. We'll have to stay up to date on all of, all of uh, this stuff. Who's the uh, pop star you mentioned? Uh, Fergal Sharkey. Fergal so Sharkey. So if, yeah, if you listen to the undertones, you'll see him on there. And they are absolutely fantastic. So there's my free gift for you today, the undertones and, and listening to those. But I just spoke to him on the phone on uh, Friday, I think it was, just a couple of days ago. And he's so passionate about it and feels very, very strongly, so much so that you need almost a swear filter on the phone as well. But it's wonderful that somebody's, and I know he listens to this, so thank you, Fergal, um, but it is amazing what he's done, and we're lucky to have people like that. But it's interesting for me, you talking how you imagine the UK. Do I take it from that, that you've not been over to the UK? Have you fished in the UK before? Nope, never been. You guys are on my list. Yeah, you need to do that. I think, you know, there's there's so many places. I know you've you've been over to Iceland. You got relatively close, haven't you? Yeah, I've been to Iceland a few times, but yeah, the England thing. You know, I I have interest in going to Scotland. Um, I would like to go to England just from the history, but I've always been a little bit put off by the price to fish there. Where could I go with, on, a, on a reasonable budget? 
That's a good question. There are lots of places, and yes, Scotland. You know, some of the and bigger name carp. rivers. I love carp, but yeah. I don't want to go to England for carp. <laughs> <laughs> you can fish some of the chalk streams at a reasonable price. Um, where I live, a season ticket, so the, the the permit to fish, because obviously we don't have open land that you can just buy a state license and go fish. Um, it's usually owned by somebody or a club or rented by a club. But to give you an idea, well, I've just rejoined a local club to me, and that works out at about £170 for the year. And that's about 11 months of fishing. So it's not horrifically expensive. Where it gets expensive is mayfly time on the chalk streams. But there are the big name rivers and and getting the chance to see the test or the itching or whatever has to be ticked off the list, I have to say. But there are some other places that you can find that may not be as expensive um, and may even in some cases be better fishing as well. So um, it's not how it might be perceived and the further you move away from london the cheaper it gets basically and the fishing can in many cases be better as well so you know there's a lot of fishing um that is accessible and and really really good fun but yeah i think you need to add that to your list or many long list of places i guess you'd like to go visit but well, like is i say wild there though you know what i mean when every time i go to a new place the first thing I do is try to find a way out of it <laughs> to get into the bush. I just want to get into the wild. So in England, does that exist? Can you go into any sort of public, crazy wilderness experience? Absolutely. In Scotland, of course, on the borders of Scotland, getting relatively close there. Even where I live down, I'm down in the very southwest of the country and I moved here to get away from people, really. So, and the fishing, of course. And I think there are places here. We've got a place called Dartmoor, which is pretty cool. And you can go fish little pocket water for little wild brown trout. The salmon and sea trout run up there as well. And so there are more places probably than you think that you can go and get away from groups of people and like I say I'm I'm down here because of that there's not so many people but um yeah you, I think you'd be really pleasantly surprised um by the variety of fishing and being away from those crowds as well I guess so yeah I could heartily recommend it okay perfect yeah cool. Charles is trying to get us over there so he loves it down there or over there Fantastic. Well, we'll see. I'm sure I can put you in touch with people and, um, you know, you've got to go make a spay cast on the spay. That's one thing you've got to do. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I know over the years that you've done so many interviews and even one on my, um, I think it was the second edition of the online magazine I ran Eat, Sleep, Fish. That was in 2012. So I thought for this podcast, rather than it being an out and out interview it would be interesting to look at your life and intertwine it with fishing rods and choosing 10 of those um so before we we dive in a was it fun to put together and were there many rods was it difficult to whittle it down to just 10 or was it easy to do it that way oh wait so i was supposed to have made a list of 10 rods well, you can do. You don't have to if you don't want to. We can just <laughs> well, this chat. Will be, this so will that's... be easy because I've got like three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's do April Vokey's three favorite rods, and uh, then we can intertwine that with your life within that, and obviously yeah, yeah, listen to your fun. podcast and following that. So I need to read my emails at... better. I apologize, Pete. <laughs> but I can definitely Not... do this. I can th- actually. I've probably got four. They're all sitting at the top of my head, so I'm ready to rock and roll. That's brilliant. Well, that's how we flow with this. It is as it goes. It's not rehearsed. It's not. So I kind of like this. So it keeps us all on our toes from that point of view. So let's look at that career in fishing and where that began, how it began. And I guess one of those rods might make the, the starting rod for number one for you. It does. It all begins with an eight-weight Shakespeare glass rod that was a hand-me-down from Dave Puffer, who is my fishing buddy. 
uh, from my teens. I met him on the river when I was quite young and I've been fishing alone and I was always putting myself in very dangerous <laughs> situations. And I just kept running into this man. And one day I agreed to fish with him. And my parents, of course, followed me out to the river and spied on us <laughs> across the river to make sure he wasn't a psycho. And anyway, he was a really good friend to me for a long time. And as I started, he was, you know, 60 and I was a teenager. So obviously I had a lot of passion and motivation and I wanted to evolve as an angler. And so I had seen these guys fly fishing and wanted to fly fish. And Dave, well, he didn't have any interest in fly fishing. He understood that I was excited and enthusiastic. And so he gave me this old fly rod that he'd had laying around. Um, he used to own a, a tackle shop back in the day. And so I don't know if it was a like a consigned rod or what the story was, but anyway, he gave it to me as a present and there was no reel or any line on it, just this rod. And he gave me some VHS tapes and, and said, I don't know where to help you from here, but um, here you go. And that was kind of, that was actually my first introduction to the fly fishing industry as well, because now I had to go and I'd been buying my gear. I used to go to, I would work to buy my gear at Fred's custom tackle, but I didn't have a fly shop and then I needed a fly line. Looking back now, I probably could have gone to Fred's, but I didn't put two and two together. I brought myself into this trade show to go and buy a fly line. And the guy was so rude to me. And I just remember feeling, and, and look, I could have been a man, woman, child. It didn't matter. He was going to be rude to anybody. It's certainly not a case of gender, but um, I just felt stupid. And I just remember feeling so stupid. And that's, you know, I don't know anyone listening right now, if you've been really embarrassed before, it's something that like you lay at night awake sometimes <laughs> thinking about, and I wasn't traumatized. I just felt stupid. And I, when, when after enough time thinking, you start to get angry and I actually got a little bit angry and I thought, well, first of all, all fly guys are assholes. <laughs> and second of all, I'm never going to make anybody ever feel like that. It's totally unnecessary. He had an opportunity. I was a customer an enthusiastic one, a young one, and uh, and I just never wanted anyone to feel that way. So after I got over my, you know, the, got the chip off and was excited to get back into fly fishing again, I was able to buy a line and start practicing and I just absolutely fell in love with it. So that little Shakespeare rod and I um, put in some miles and before I knew it, it was time to upgrade to something a little bit nice. easier to cast. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. So you say it's an eight weight. So I'm guessing that journey started with steelhead, did it for you? No, I was using that thing for anything. I was using it for <laughs> trout, grass, cats on the drive, anything. Um, I didn't. I didn't know then that because again, this is all just kind of thrown at me. And even though I'm sure that the tapes that I had did explain weights of rods. I didn't watch any of that. I mean, I was like 16 years old. I'm fast forwarding to show me how to cast. That's all I care about. Just show me how to cast. Uh, so I didn't understand any of that. Uh, it wasn't actually until I really started reading that that all kind of came about. So at the time there was no internet. If there was, we certainly didn't have it. So this was, you know, library days. And so I spent a ton of time reading about fishing gear and that's when it all kind of clicked. Nice, nice. And it's interesting. I don't know. I sense you may be similar that I'm sort of regressing a bit that I put out on my Facebook the other day. I bought a, a glass um, salmon rod to start the season and I fish bamboo pretty much exclusively. Have you, I've sensed you've come full circle as well. Have, have you? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Actually, I've come full circle and then back around. So well, I've come full circle back to gear. I'll explain. So um, you know, I started out fishing gear for years before I fished the fly and then obviously got my eight weight. And then because I wanted to make it easier on myself, started fishing, you know, carbon fiber and all, all of that fun stuff. And then it wasn't, and we can, we can backtrack into those days, but I did circle back in or, you know, take my evolution into bamboo 
which I have since stayed in many ways. And I'll, I'll come back to that rod because that's a very special rod. But then now that I'm a mom and have – people can't see right now. I've got my hands at like this. I've got my left hand and my right hand on like a 180, right? Because I'm going to draw the line for you to get back to 360. <laughs> yeah. And so as I've become a mom now and I have less time – I'm not as much – I'm not out there for the 12-hour day anymore. You know how it used to be? I don't know if you have kids, but you used to go out there for 12 hours and you're just trying to fill the day. Well, now I don't have that time, so I've gone back to being – fishing whatever is going to make the most sense at the time. So if that means that, especially if I have my daughter with me, I need to catch a fish, then I'm going to be fishing the fastest rod – or not the fastest rod, but the easiest rod to cast – Something that is not going to hit her in the head if she's on my back. And I'm going to be fishing an egg-sucking leech, right? <laughs> like I'm not wasting time with swinging dry flies. I'm trying to catch a fish to make the day entertaining. So I, in that aspect, I've done this 360 all the way back to where I started almost with gear. But it, it has been – how old am I? 39. So it has been – so I started this at 16. So it's been a long time – to have that sort of full circle. And so for the purpose of this podcast, I'll, I'll bring you back a few years and stop at the bamboo. So obviously I've done this fishing and with guiding and stuff, you fish a lot of graphite rods. And then when I was guiding, I saw this bamboo rod by Bob Clay. And I'd fished bamboo before. I even owned a couple single hand bamboo rods, but they mostly collected that's dust in the garage. And then when I saw Bob's rod, I realized that you could have these two hand bamboo rods that were fully functional and capable of turning over heavier flies and shooting lines and bigger, you know, presentations. And I fell in love. And so I saved up and bought myself my first bamboo rod or my first Bob Clay rod. And just, it just changed the whole game for me. It was, it was at a time where, and, and I hope that this is relatable to some people, at some point in many of our evolutions as anglers, we wonder why we're doing it. And it was all happening at a time where I was starting to get into hunting. And for me, as someone who was getting into hunting, it made me question a lot of things. Why am I releasing this fish? Should And you know, with conservation, should I just be letting this fish go? I care about the fish. I don't need to catch the fish to speak up for them. Why? Like, why the hell am I doing all of this? I was just losing my why. And that was when I turned again to reading because it has always served me well. So I started reading about the history. And the more that I learned about the history of the sport, the more my enthusiasm and my passion for it began to come back. And so in reading about the past, obviously bamboo rods are a huge part of that. And I realized that I, a major part of the reason I was fishing was to connect to these old, not necessarily the old guard or the old people, but the old Me me maybe methodology, all of it, the whole, the whole history of it. And so I became obsessed with, um, fishing bamboo rods and knowing the story about how that rod came to be and who the maker was. And I'm trying to take a whole romantic novel here and put it into a two minute soundbite. But yeah, that bamboo rod in an, in, with a number of other things had brought my passion back for fishing. I hope that makes sense. It does. And I, it does make me wonder that this renaissance we've seen in glass and, and bamboo, as you mentioned, whether that's driven by how we have the tackle now is so good that there isn't the need to update it. It's been almost refined. And obviously, we're going to get fly lines are super important, as we know. But rods particularly, it's not, right, there's a new one this year or three years. I've got to change it. And I don't think that's happening in the same way. And it does make me wonder if people, be it romantic reasons, be it them delving into the history um, of fishing, that they're looking at something else to express their love of fishing and to fish in that way. And, you know, like yourself, I've been fishing bamboo a long time, but I've just sort of felt, right, I don't need a new graphite rod right now. And I end up getting another bamboo one. And the glass rod I talk about is probably, funnily enough, a, a, a gateway for a bamboo double-hander as well. I was talking to my friend who built them the other day, and we, I, I think it's there. Do you, do you sense that? The tackle is almost at a level it's so nicely refined that the changes that we're seeing, particularly in rods, is so small and incremental 
that there isn't that need that 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 leap on in technology isn't really there right now. Do you do you sense that? It's annoyingly refined, and I'm pretty vocal about this on my show. In that, it, you guys, it, it's dialed. It it is insulting to me as a consumer and somebody who understands marketing to see that every year there has to be a newly released rod. To me, as a business owner, and, and again, someone who I think understands marketing, I see it as doing yourself a disservice by constantly coming out with a new rod because you're almost telling the customer, you should have buyer's remorse on the rod that you bought last year because now we have an even better one. Um, and then I won't even get into environmental footprint and what it could mean uh, in that respect. Uh, yes, I think it is annoyingly refined and at this point, almost offensive. Same with all the new fly lines and all of the new sink tips and it was refined a long time ago. Let's just settle into it now and stop confusing people. Yeah. And I think with the rods as well, thinking about that now that you say it, that that we're fishing with a bamboo or a glass rod, whatever, it takes out that, you know, everything seems to be so technical and complicated when in my simple little mind, if we're talking about trout, get the fly to the, the fish, don't spook it and get a good drift. And a lot of those things still work and hold true. And do we need all the stuff that goes with it? And I think I'm I'm possibly like you in that sense that I'm rebelling against that a little bit and saying, actually, I don't need that. What I've got is an older material, but man, it works well for me. And do you you think that might be a part of it as well? Yeah, I I just, yes, in short. Um, I think that there's always conversation is so rare these days to be able to, to sit down and have any sort of, not just long form conversation, but any sort of genuine conversation where people are actually listening to each other. If we're going to talk about fishing, there are lots of things to talk about. And, and again, I won't, I'll keep it just on technical stuff. I won't even go into conservation or any of that other, um, any of that side of, things, but let's just talk technical. We could talk about how to, oh, I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm long winding myself here, but you could talk about different techniques to get that drift to that fish. Um, and, and, and that would be a good conversation, but that conversation is getting overshadowed by talking about which speed of rod I need. And let me just summarize this again, because clearly I haven't had enough coffee yet this morning. Um, I only have so much time in a day to talk to somebody, right? And I've got several thousand members on my website. If you have five minutes to talk to me, anybody, you, a member, my mom, anybody, why not make it good? And the amount of people who take that five minutes to ask me if they should buy a Sage One or an NRX makes me want to bash my head against the wall. There are just way better things to talk about at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I get exactly where you're coming from. And I, th- yeah, I'm, I'm doing my little, in my own little way, trying to get people to think perhaps, you know, concentrate on getting a decent fly line because that makes the, the job easier and learn some of those casts that are going to help you get that drag free drift as well. So let's navigate out of that, um, a little bit. And so you've learned to cast, you've been watching the video. Uh, did you sense, was there a tipping point for you where you suddenly thought, actually, this is for me? This is, you know, I've got another job. I'm really passionate about what I'm doing. Was there that tipping point that you suddenly realized, yes, this is for me. This is my thing. It is fly fishing. Where, where was that? And was there a rod that intertwined with that as well? Well, I knew fishing was my thing, not necessarily fly fishing, but I knew fishing was my thing very, very early, you know, as a, I would have been four or five. I knew that that was going to be my thing. Fly fishing. Yes. I had been fishing with my bait caster and, and went down to this lower run on the Vedder river and saw these guys fly fishing for salmon. And it was just one of those perfectly, you know, those perfect summer days where, everything smells good. You don't have to be anywhere that night. The sun's taking forever to go down. The fishing's good. Just one of those perfect days. And yeah, I poked my head out and saw those guys fly fishing and it was just the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I'd never seen it before. 
I mean, I'd seen pictures of it on the you know posters and bathrooms and stuff, but I'd never seen it. And that was it. I went home in a daze. I told my parents that's what I was going to be doing for a living. They had no idea what I was talking about, but they heard me when I said that. And that was it. I set out at so I would have been in my teens, and I set out to strategize and plan my whole life around it. And I'm almost forty now, and still still doing the same thing. It's a little different now. I mean, back then I was trying to find a way to be on the water every day and be paid for it. Cause obviously I had bills to pay. I was a kid, um, who wanted to go to restaurants and all that fun stuff. And I had dreams about one day owning a house. And so the answer at the time was guiding, but the only way to guide is you have to know what you're doing. So I'd go fishing every day, um, relentlessly, to my parents were not happy with me, but my response was, this is my school. This is me teaching myself so that I can have a thriving business at some point. And, um, that's kind of how it all started in my late teens. And did that take time to learn the trade, but also, (laughs) you know, was it a a long journey or because I I think when I started guiding and set up my business I reckon and it was pre-social media really there was a bit of Facebook but not a great deal it was hard it took me about five years to get people to see that you actually existed and you were doing it and you sort of knew what you were talking about I took basic exams I took advanced ones all those sorts of things did you find in in during those times, it was more difficult to enter into that career path and and, Way and more difficult. be recognized. Yeah, and be recognized for knowing what you're talking about as well. Yeah, because impressions, you know, whether it's today's marketing or marketing 30 years ago, can I say that? No, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, it, it's all about making it, you know, you've got to impressions, right? You've got to put your face out there. And nowadays, you can pay algorithms to figure that out for you. But back then I had to just be everywhere. So I I picked up a part-time job at a fly shop so that again, I could build brand recognition. I mean, that's really what it was. I was a brand. So I had to let people know who I was by being at the shop. I had to be on the river every day. I wanted people to see me out there, um, guiding, speaking at clubs, if that ever came my way, trying to hustle to get my articles published. This was before social media, before Facebook. So when Facebook finally did come out and I was in the the heart of trying to market myself, it was just a, it made sense. It was, it was a great opportunity. Um, the downside of course was I was one of, I definitely was the first woman advertising on Facebook, not advertising from a monetary stance, but putting myself out there, but not just being the first woman, I was one of the first people out there doing it. And it, of course, left a lot of, it left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. And rightfully so. Who There was this new marketing platform and nobody knew what it meant. Um, I mean, it could have been Simon Gosworth out there marketing. He would have had the same sort of criticism I was getting. It, it's just people were scared. Are we going to be sharing spots that we shouldn't be sharing? Which has happened. Are we going to be promoting fisheries that can't handle the pressure, which has happened? Um, You know, are we, what is the down, what are the downsides of this? Everyone's afraid of the unknown. So it it came with perks in that it worked, but it came with downsides in that, you know, I, I felt quite alienated by a lot of my peers at the time. And I know having worked in the industry, peers, what your peers think of you, if you write an article, if you do whatever, that's one of the first things I think about. How would they see that? Was that difficult? Like you say, was it difficult to deal with then on that that basis that the profile was growing and growing and growing? And like you say, there was some flack in the background from some people. Was that difficult to deal with as well? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean most of the of the venting happened in forums, not just with me, but with anybody, right? This would happen. Uh this was back when forums still carried quite a bit of weight. And then the comment sections and yeah, the comment sections were it was the wild west back then. I mean, I guess it actually still is. I don't think much has changed there. Was it hard for me personally? Yeah. But I also was, you know, 20 years old and 
righteous. I, I could do no wrong. <laughs> you know, in my head, I knew everything and I was right. So a lot of it, it just was immaturity looking back. But I would, I would do the same. I would still do it again. I would do it all over again. Cause a lot of the hate wasn't, I was always on top of not showing spots. Okay. Cause that was something that everybody knew. Um, I started fishing when we, when there was film, we weren't necessarily using, you know, we were still bringing my stuff into superstore to get developed <laughs> and paying extra for a 24 hour yeah, service. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, when digital cameras came, we were used to pointing the camera down and not showing our spots. And then I knew I wasn't necessarily promoting a fishery any more so than, than anybody else. And if I was, it was, it was with tact and, you know, with science. And, and so I have no regrets about that, but, um, I was picked on and I'll say picked on because it really was being picked on for what I was wearing. Um, obviously looking back now, I, you might say, think that I was picked on for holding my fish out of the water, but that wasn't a thing then we didn't think about, mm-hmm. I mean, we all lit, hoisted our fish up for grip and grins, but as long as there was water dripping off of it, it was kind of acceptable. Um, but I was, I was picked on for what I was wearing and that really made me, well, it was just very confusing. I couldn't understand why that was a problem. When I say what I was wearing, I mean like wearing a pink scarf was a problem. I always had clothes on, but to be wearing a pink scarf, like people were really bothered at the fact that my cardigan would match my scarf, even though they were both from REI or, you know, an outdoor shop that seemed to really bother people or that my hair looked smooth because I'd just come from the casino after, after waitressing all night. Like, so the hate was very confusing and it definitely made me, um, angry, I guess, if I had to summarize it as a word, it made me angry and it made me a little bit bitter at the time, which made me as a young woman lash out and definitely have a chip on my shoulder. So it was, yeah, it was a very conflicting, confusing time because I just didn't understand why men were so mean. I just didn't, I've never, I dealt with mean men. I mean, I was a young woman cocktailing at a casino, but I'd never had it come in droves in the comment section. And because there were no but other I, women doing it, it was especially polarizing. Yeah, yeah. And I sense, and I know, obviously, because history has shown that, that chip is probably one of the things that's driven you, hasn't it, and put you where you are now. Yeah, I'd say for the first decade it did. For the first 10 years, it definitely did because I was constantly being – I mean, when it – so what I started doing was I started dressing down. All right, so let me make myself look – unattractive. All right. So then that didn't work. Then it was, you know, enter rumor or slag here. And then at some point I just stopped caring. You know what I mean? At some point you get your knees broken so many times you're like, I just don't, you guys, I got to move on with life. And Mm -hmm. so I just, that was it. And as soon as I stopped caring, what do you know? It just stopped happening. (laughs) Maybe the comments are still there and I don't see them. I don't know. But for some reason, it's just, it all just kind of stopped. Um, and now, you know, for the last, so again, almost 40, yeah, last 10 years, I'd say I just focus on trying to, to connect with like-minded people, focusing on, on the good community. Cause there's actually a fantastic community of anglers and, and new anglers out there. And, and I've never been happier. Things, things have, um, done a major shift. Yeah. I think when you care, and I see this on a lot of young women's profiles, and again, that's the other part of this, the elephant in the room is that. I, I'm no longer the only one out there. There's a lot of other women out there now. So obviously the hate, let's just call it hate because it's kind of what it is, can be dispersed. Um, but I see that a lot of the young men and women who get a lot of the negative feedback are the ones who let it bother them the most. And so it tends to manifest. Whereas um, for me, when I stopped caring, it all kind of just disappeared. Do you think that's maturity as well though? Yeah, I think so. And I think I'm just a lot more boring than I used to be. You know, people, yeah. I'm not as exciting to talk about. <laughs> I'm just quite a <laughs> boring human nowadays, but I like it like that. Um, and yeah, I think maturity. I, and I think once you obviously get a few years under your belt, you just, you, you there are things that, especially as a mom, you prioritize, right? I'm not going to be upset mm. about a, a, a comment on YouTube. Whereas that used to, a comment on YouTube used to keep me up for nights. And, and, and that's the other thing. The other thing to think about is every single video nowadays has got a plethora of, you know, 
horrible comments underneath it. And that was, that's common now, but it was kind of new back then, if that makes sense. Like if you read any sort of comments now, it's always got something to do with race, politics, or gender, right? Um, And so everyone's used to seeing the hateful comments now and we can all just kind of skip past them. But back then when someone wrote something like that, I know myself and others would feel the need to defend ourselves. Whereas, because it was a big deal being called out, but nowadays it's everyone just moves on. It's no big deal. Yeah. Yeah. You, you've just got to do that. And I wonder if part of that is a confidence in what you're doing and seeing that formula is actually working and you forget about that negative stuff in the background anyway, don't you? And you just move on. And like you say, I remember, you know, I had some dust ups and you find that you can almost be in a position where you're defending yourself by starting the conversation if you know what I mean well it wasn't what this was and and so and and now I'm like you I just don't care and I don't look at stuff I don't you know I'm sure it is something to do with that but yeah I, I get how those things you know it's not as amplified as as you had to go through but I know having had dust ups how those things um, have played out but so you're guiding uh we won't say that and I used to get it all the time and I'm sure you did what a glamorous job it is um you get to go fishing every day um and so we know Do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> but anything but and I even get actually asking about that we'll come on to you setting up fly gal um shortly did you get throughout your guiding career and I had several times with it did you get guide burn that you just thought actually I'm starting to question yeah every year yeah every year but I said that I would do 10 years of guiding and and I am a woman of my word so that is exactly what I did um I loved guiding I I entertain the idea now of picking up some guided trips because, I mean, you get to spend a wonderful day outside with people you genuinely care about. And my my guests were the best. I, I love them. Um, and, and I miss them and it would be great to be able to be on the water with them again. But at some point, and here's the thing about guiding on – when I was guiding on the Dean, for example. See, when it's a day trip, it's always fun and exciting from start to finish. But when it's a week-long trip – you're with your clients for breakfast and then you go to bed with, you know, at not with them at night. You go to bed at night after having a couple drinks with them in a lodge environment. And so after day two or three, they're like, hey, April, this is our fifth year fishing with you. <laughs> We've just spent the last three nights together. Can you like go <laughs> so I can just fish in yeah. peace? There's nothing else to talk about. And at that point, I was feeling like a prisoner on the river because you can't fish. And there are only so many rocks that you can pick up and look at. I eventually went back to school while guiding. I just would download all of my lessons on my on my phone and have them be audio recordings. And I'd put them in. I had this – I always would wear this Patagonia um, better sweater with, the, with a pocket on a sleeve. And I'd just stick it in my – sleeve and obviously have it low enough so no one could hear. I'd be far enough behind. I'd I'd just be back at school listening to all my lessons in an audio version. And that's how the podcast actually started because at some point – because your brain rots, right? And I don't know about you, but my brain – for anyone listening right now, surely you can tell by my cadence and how my thought process (laughs) works. My brain is always going 100 miles an hour. It's it's torture. And so I like to listen to either music or – educational series or podcast to just slow down. So I started listening to podcasts and then I thought this would be a great time. This would be a great thing for me to do. And it all kind of, again, pieced together with what I was doing with television, which I'm sure you're going to ask about. Um, and then, you know, the pivot in my career. So podcasting was a big part of staying sane while guiding, which sounds crazy, but Ask yourself, if you're listening right now and you've always wanted to guide, imagine that you've got four days left on the river and no one to talk to. What do you do? What do you do? What What would you do, Pete? Um, I'd probably listen to podcasts as well. <laughs> but no, I would be, yeah, you, you know, that's the question often. I would say to people, if there's that big f- fish rising under the branch and there's somebody stuffing that cast, would you want to grab that rod and make that cast? 
and that was I often get people saying I want to be a guide I'm really good at fishing and I said look it's not just about that and I think it's you're in the hospitality business really more than anything else and I used to look for the ability with guides who work with us their ability to get on with people that was the really important thing for me that they would give people a good time and it's their one day off perhaps to go fishing once a year let's make it special for them so that's how I think I would um, think about that so yeah and having not done it now for a couple of years I don't miss it one little bit and I love fishing even more. It's brought me back around full circle again to say, yeah, I, I love it even more. And I've rediscovered what it actually means to me. So, yeah, it means something pretty special. But like you say, you touched on the podcast thing. I want to come onto that because to me, you know, setting up Fly Gal as going independent, I guess, was, you know, you were on, really on top of your game. You knew your water. You knew many of those aspects of the the guiding business and so you set up on your your own was that a big step or was it a natural step it was a big step because i was guiding for somebody else at the time and as you'd mentioned you know your community and your peers matter especially in your early 20s and so i started flygal in 2007 and um, started to take on my own trips and eventually my own guiding license and I broke free and it was it was a, a big move, um, a, an uncomfortable one at first because, you know, there's always the the fear of your, your employer, your, the outfitter thinks you're going to take customers and it's just a bit of an awkward move. I wasn't actually going to tell anyone that I was branching out on my own and I ran into my boss at the time um, pricing accommodation somewhere. And he was like, what are you doing here? <laughs> uh, pricing accommodation for my clients, by the way, I'm going independent. So it yeah. all, um, it all happened a little bit uncomfortably. I probably would have more communication now, like looking back now, I would have had way more communication, but again, yeah, like you, um, well, not, I guess not like you, but yeah, no, I, no regrets, no regrets. I, I, yeah. I was happy to start fly gallon. And again, I was doing the casino thing and I was taking all of these people fishing, not just people from the casino, but fellow cocktail servers and just loving it. And so it made sense to be paid for it and not be just taking a 10% commission from my, from the outfitter. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. And then as your reputation's continuing to grow, you're writing articles. And then like you say, you moved into TV and um, you started appearing on a series and then you had your own series as well, which we didn't get over here. We get some um, fishing programs, but not so many. And I believe it was called Shorelines. Could you tell us a little bit about Shorelines and how that um, came about? And then I guess we ought to ask you about another rod as well after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah. Shorelines was – I wanted to – it had started with the book that I wanted to write, which has since been put on hold, um, largely because it's already been written by John Shuey. <laughs> but I wanted to write a book par- uh, exploring the parallels between Atlantic salmon fishing and steelhead fishing. And really my agenda, if I had one, was I wanted to prove that it was all because of Roderick Haig Brown. And so when the World Fishing Network asked me if I wanted to do a television series, and we'd had a number of or I'd been discussing different concepts with producers for years, but they were always really tacky, right? Like reality series of you fishing with other women in a boat to see what sort of drama ensues, that kind of garbage. And so I'd been turning down television for years. And then when they said, we'll take, or they told the production house, what can like, just give us an idea, any idea. And I, I wanted to subsidize my book. I said, well, let's do, this book idea. And so Shorelines was produced. And so I wrote the series and hosted it and teamed up with a good friend of mine, um, Nick Pujic, who owns VP Media House. And we did the show. And I loved the show. Um, it was a, it was a great experience, but it let me sit down and talk to people. That's really what the show is based on. It's not a fish heavy show. It's a interview heavy show. And I loved it and have continued to love hearing stories and talking to people about their stories. I always leave and especially with the show, I was always leaving feeling like I was a better person or like my eyes had opened in one way or another. So I thought, you know, with editing, we had to cut out a, the majority of the interviews and that was a real shame. So I thought, well, we'll do a podcast and I won't have to cut out any of this amazing 
content. I'll just be able to share these people's story with, st- stories with the world. And so that's how Anchored started. That's really cool. And it's it's fascinating for me in the podcast that I do is uncovering or discovering the backstories. And it's the backstories, in my humble opinion, the, the really interesting ones. Do you, did you find that on the series that you did? Yeah. I mean, 100%. It's it's you t- you interview someone who's 90 years old and the things that they have seen wow i'm just my brain's f- fran- it's just flashing all these people through my head as i'm sitting here and and yeah not only is it just it's entertaining in a lot of ways but it's just so inspiring and they almost always have a lesson for me and the listener at the end of it you know they always have some sort of you know, old, older people, <laughs> there's always some sort of message that they're trying to convey. And, and they're really, the ones that I've had on the show, the guests I've had on the show have been really special people. Fantastic. That sounds really cool. I wish we got the chance to see that. And you touched on, um, salmon and steelhead, and I guess this is slightly loaded from your background, but which of the two and what were your conclusions and, um, how, I, it's a really difficult one to answer, I know, but what, what did you draw from the two species and what is it that you love about them? Well, I wanted to show that Roderick Haig Brown had come over from the UK, he'd come to Vancouver Island in the 30s and had brought with him all the methodology and this, that, and the other thing that it was all him. And because of course I, I love Roderick Haig Brown and I wanted to put him on an even higher pedestal. But then I found out about John S. Ben, who came over from Ireland in the 1880s. And a lot of this is actually uh, because of him. Um, And then obviously, if you start looking at swung fly tactics, rather than coming from the West Coast, we've got to go to the East Coast. Everyone, you know, basically leaves Scotland. They come over to Nova Scotia, New Scotland, and they start bringing the methods with them there. So my whole timeline was skewed and... um, and as and I would have written about that, but then John Shuey put out this amazing book. I think it's called Classic Steelhead Flies. I'd have to pull it up behind me here. But he just does this fabulous job taking each fly and explaining the history behind it. And maybe the parallels could be a little bit more straightforward. So there's prob- probably still another book idea in there somewhere. But um, at the time when I saw John's book, it 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 scratched the itch enough that I kind of just put mine on hold. So the show had one season, um, the world fishing network canceled. They didn't cancel their budgeting, but they swapped out their formats rather than buy shows. People were buying airtime. So I think they kept one of their 12 shows that they had purchased. Um, so we didn't go on with another season and I was not about to buy airtime. I'm just not, um, into investing in television right now, but, uh, so the show only got the one season, but the podcast, don't be sad that you missed it. The podcast just is the show, but 10 times more in depth, I guess. And without the pretty visuals. And what are you most proud of then? The TV program or the podcast or it, no, like you say, the they're, they're pretty much. Yeah. Definitely right. the podcast. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> excuse me. It's, um, it's what. It's the underlying message of the podcast. You know, the TV show, yeah, I'm proud of what April Vokey did on the TV show, sure. But the podcast is not me. I am simply the person who presses power and listens and then publishes it. The podcast is what I'm at, almost 200 episodes. So it's 200 people who have shared their some of their most inner secrets and then what's really cool about the show, and I just got like a little bit of a like a giddy butterfly in my tummy, so I know that the passion is clearly still there for it. These are people, many of them, who have never even heard of social media. Uh, and the season, I mean, I'm in season seven, so it's been around a few years now. And a lot of these guys and gals do not have social media, but they have the most interesting stories to tell, but no one to tell them to you know, in, in a large scale audience anyway. And so it's been unbelievably satisfying to learn from their stories. I mean, how, what an honor to hear their stories, but then share their stories. And then this is the best part, watching the community, the listener reach out and connect with those people. 
And, and I don't think people listening understand quite the impact that this has. Some of my guests have been in nursing homes and they have genuinely thought in tears with me, telling me that they've been forgotten about. And then to have thousands of people hear their stories and then a hundred of them reach out, it brings them back to life. And that is the coolest thing. It's totally reinvigorated all of my hope and passion for the fly fishing community. I went from thinking all fly fishermen were total dickheads to just seeing this incredible, incredible, intelligent, empathetic, wonderful community. So yeah, I, I, I owe that podcast my entire career and it definitely has kept me here. There's no question. And you've, you've had so many, like you say, interesting guests, you covered so many topics and I know I've touched base with you on, on a few of them. You had somebody local, a, a, a girl who um, was guiding and fishing locally that I, I thought was a beautifully, as a host, you, you um, handled it beautifully. You've, you've covered difficult topics as well. Um, so obviously, the, some of the, the famous ones about social media, et cetera, et cetera. But I think one of my favorite, and I know, and I'd love to understand this a little bit more, that you widened out a little bit more. And I wondered if that was a reflection of where your life was, where you looked at not just fishing, but you looked at other aspects. And it was one of the hunting ones. And I don't hunt, but it was about bow hunting and how you talked with your guests. And many apologies, because I don't um, remember his name um, off the top of my head, but how you covered how um, taking an animal with a bow and how it dealt with, you know, there wasn't the startled when the gun shot and everything else. It really made so much sense to me and it was beautifully covered and explained. And like you say, you're incredibly proud, but that looking at things on a wider scale, was that the way your life was, but was it also, did you think I need to move away from fishing every now and again to keep it it, it fresh or it was just the, the route your life was going at the time? From a business stance, moving away from fishing was actually a bad idea, but I try not to necessarily, especially with the show, I don't look at numbers at all. I just look at what feels right. Um, I wanted to interview and learn from other people who have other interests like my own, right? And so I wanted to, especially early on in my hunting, I'll never say career, my hunting journey, I wanted to um, be able to have long form conversation and learn from a lot of these guys and gals. Now, did that alienate some of my fly fishing listeners? Probably, but it's so simple just to not listen to an episode. Do you know what I mean? So I, yeah. I still probably for every 20 fishing episodes do one about something else, um, from somebody who really inspires me. But, but yeah, I mean, look, the podcast has been the source of some major uproar. I podcasted Donald Trump Jr. And, um, that had people boycotting the show saying that they'd never listen again, but I stand by, um, you know, just don't press play. And, and I know the Trump thing is a totally different topic. And to be honest, it was all recorded before hell shit hit the fan, um, with all of that. And I had been asked not to talk about politics. I, I carefully navigated through public land because I was very curious. I'd had a couple guests on who had been very, vocal about public land. And I just wanted to hear from Donald Trump Jr., his thoughts on it. The behind the scenes of that episode that people don't know is that it actually resulted in some relationships being formed with him and some other companies that I'm just going to keep nameless right now. Um, it opened up a door of communication. So there's always another side to every story. But but my short answer is um, from a business stance, no, it was certainly not a business decision. From a personal stance, yes, I was feeling a little bit burnt out with fishing. And just wanted to talk to some other people about something I was really passionate about. Um, and then from a public stance, I just hope that people, um, you know, understood that they could skip the episode if they wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure people listening to this in the UK have heard and have probably listened to Anchored, your podcast. So there's little doubt in my mind about that. But if you haven't, you should listen um, to it. They are really excellent. And then Anchored sort of went a little bit further into Anchored Outdoors. And does that, that's a whole new sort of 
um, different sort of concept that you've worked with, which is really fascinating. Can you can you tell listeners a little bit about that and how that came about as well? Yeah, yeah, it is. <clears throat> it is even cooler to me than the podcast. It's my favorite thing I've ever done. This is where I have landed. I will not be leaving or going anywhere else. This is where you'll find me until I die. Knock on wood. And um, <laughs> so basically with the podcast being an audio podcast, there is just a lot of video that's being left out. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I had a lot of people asking for demonstration. Like, can you show us what you're talking about? And so I thought, well, yeah, let's make a whole, let's put together a community, a membership called Anchored Outdoors and have all these visuals. So that's since grown and evolved. And now I offer, or we offer um, masterclasses. So <clears throat> rather than listen to Brian Chan talk about chronomid fishing for an hour, you can listen to him talk about chronomid fishing for an hour and understand his whole backstory and then watch his, you know, 20 odd chapter masterclass where he breaks down how to chronomid fish from start to finish. I think you guys call it buzzer fishing in England, right? Yeah. So it's just a <clears throat> visual um, series really and, and a membership and <clears throat> excuse me, a way for us to connect as members and be able to just learn from the guests. So there's two parts of Anchored Outdoors. There's the master classes, which you can buy individually um, or you can buy all of them with an all-inclusive package, but there's also just our base membership. And so that's a series of videos, basically starting from A going through to Z, um, currently working on building out the latter half of the alphabet right now, but from A to Z, learning to fly fish, and all of the content is created by guests of the show. So it's it's cool to you know be watching a video knowing that you're learning from Rick Kustich and you know all about his struggles when he first started fly fishing. So yeah, we call it the connect approach. And it's really just learning from people that you know and trust. You don't need to worry about if they're trusted professionals like you do when you're on YouTube. It's not all scattered all over the internet like it is on YouTube. It's very much a specifically set program. Um, we do interactive events with all of these people so that you can have direct access to them. Yeah. It's uh it's just a community, an educational community that is based around the show. And that's where I first saw Bob Clay's name as well. And I've seen him in one of the American magazines recently as well. And they, I, I know you've got a, a course on there about building bamboo rods, haven't you? Yeah. He did our rod building masterclass. It's, it's really it's really cool. I mean, it's a pretty big job building a rod, but like that's a prime example. So you know you can trust Bob. You watch the series. He walks you through from start to finish. But then after you finish the class, there's also a community. So you can weigh in on the guys in the community, and Bob himself is there as part of the community. So he's answering questions. So it's just – it's yeah, it's taking what we start talking about on the podcast to the next level. You know what I mean? So someone might listen to the podcast and Bob Clay's story on the podcast and go, he's a cool guy. And you listen because he's a cool guy, but then you listen to him talk about how to build bamboo rods and you go, oh, I might want to build a bamboo rod. I wonder how I could get started. And so it's nice with Anchored Outdoors. You can just go to Anchored Outdoors and take his class. And what do you know? You can ask him a question when you have one. So it was really just taking it all to the next level. Nice. And that segues beautifully onto your rod and I guess you said the Bob Clay rod and um mm -hmm. I remember seeing a video I think were you fishing it in New Zealand was it New Zealand I you fished it everywhere fishing? I am obsessed yeah, yeah. with Bob's rods I have two and they are the most beautiful things and that's I mean so I had people taking the class just because they own Bob's rods and they wanted to see what goes into it because I'll be out there fishing his rod and fishing can suck and I'll still be out there thinking about, oh, remember that video where he was, you know, using the torch to get this beautiful color on the rod and, you know, you, it just takes your relationship with fishing and the gear that you're using to the next level. Yeah, nice. Nice. Yeah. I, I sort of, I've, I've had a guest on and we talked about building a glass rod, but I, I said, I asked him the question, do I start on a cheap blank? He said, well, to start on an expensive one, but I think my first one would be so bad that 
I wouldn't fish it. So I can't figure that, I can't rationalize that out at the moment. And I want to do it justice. I don't want to build a rod and leave it in the cupboard because I'm too embarrassed to fish it. So I, it's the perfectionist in me that wants to get it right. And the perfectionist in me is frightened that I might get it wrong. So I still haven't stepped down that route, but we'll we'll get there eventually. But it was interesting, you mentioned your daughter and getting the time to fish. And it seems to me, again, from your social media and, and everything else, you've sort of immersed her into your world pretty seamlessly, haven't you? Yeah, I just take her with me. Um, the The conflict now is my daughter is somehow obsessed with fashion. <laughs> Don't ask me how that happened. But so now there's a lot of compromising. You know, I've got another little human and we have to go, okay, fine. Okay, mom. Like the other day we went, she came deer, I'm going to say hunting in quotations. We were looking for a deer out in the bush, but of course that, that had to come with a trade. So half the day is spent doing what I want to do and half the day is spent doing what she wants to do. So it's not, I think people think of children as being a time suck for a number of, of reasons, but it, She's a time suck, not in the way that I had thought. Um, it's more just having a best friend that I have to share my interest with. So I don't get quite as much time for myself as I used to. And so that's why when I am out there, I, I want to be, you know, making it fun. I mean, look, if I'm by myself, because obviously I take quite a bit of time for myself just to fish, um, then I don't need to fish, you know, crazy egg sucking leeches. I'll fish something a little more to my liking. Um, but it just depends on the situation. Yeah. And I guess where you're based right now in Australia, you're saltwater fishing predominantly, are you? No, I mean, we fish, I'm going to go down. Well, yeah, we've got a salt trip this weekend, but then I'm looking at the calendar, thinking about going back down to the snowies. We spent a lot of time trout fishing there. Uh, before this whole COVID mess, we were spending a lot of time in New Zealand. Murray cod in Australia are world-class. So lots of that. And that's a good one because it's not um, crazy deep water. There's a, a lot of very accessible water that Adelaide can come on uh, with me. She's now out of the backpack. So we're exploring certain fisheries and how to do it without getting our legs too tired. Nice. Nice. Fantastic. We've talked for over an hour now and I won't keep you too much longer. What advice, because we've looked and let's forget about the 10 fly rods thing. This is much more interesting chatting about life and, and life in fishing and the outdoors as well. You say, you know, that you're, you're 39 now. Is there any different advice that you would give the 16 year old April who was thinking about working in fishing would you have done anything differently or are you happy with the path that your life has taken from a industry standpoint from a working standpoint um are you happy with that route would you've done anything differently would you've changed anything i think not really um look i had to make mistakes i'm not saying i didn't make mistakes i made lots of them i I'm a hothead. I say stupid things all the time. Um, I've said many stupid things. I, I probably wouldn't, I know what I would have done differently. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is something I would have done differently. I would have learned to have said no a lot earlier and held my ground on letting people use my image in a way that I did not approve of. There were so many times where people would publish me or, or, use me for something. And when I'd say, but no, I'm not comfortable with that. They'd be like, well, you don't own it. So there's really nothing you can do. So I would have been a lot more careful with my image earlier on and not worried about being painted as a quote unquote diva. Um, I would have turned down projects. I mean, I've rolled in to do filming projects and, and just knew right away that it was not what I wanted to do, but kind of been forced into it because I'd been paid to be there. Um, not even paid to be there, like had my flight paid to go there. And I would have absolutely shut that down now looking back. So yeah, I think my answer is um, I would have made all the mistakes that I made, but I would have been a lot more happy to have said no without being worried about being painted as a diva. Because at the time, sexism, look, sexism does exist. And in in my career, it certainly was there. 
And the second that I ever stood up for myself, it just was immediately that, oh, she's a difficult, she's a difficult woman. She's a piece of work, you know, that kind of thing. So I just started to keep my mouth shut. And unfortunately, I do regret some of those decisions that I, I made to stay quiet. Right. And, and you do strike me as somebody who, when they have seen a crossroads on the path of their life, or they've seen that turn off, they've generally, t- it seems to me, pretty much always taken the right turn off as well. Would you, would you, is that fair to say? Because I think sometimes one. people, well, it, it seems to me that I, the, the journey, let's use that J word, the life and that path that you're on, sometimes there are crossroads. And it strikes me as I get older, sometimes people don't realize there's a crossroads and their head is always down on that same path continually. And it strikes me that you've always spotted those crossroads and probably been ahead and had the, the sat nav on internally a little bit more quickly than, than perhaps others may have noticed. Is that a fair comment to say that, that you, you've, you've seen those opportunities or those changes and, and, and taken them? Yes. And that's all, I mean, that goes, it piggybacks with things I should have said, said no on is sometimes to my detriment, I love, I will take an opportunity because my whole career has been a series of pivots and I don't regret that at all. Um, but yeah, and I think that that is something that I hope other people listening or people in the industry, if no people in life are listening to is that there are a series of crossroads and it's very, very easy to accidentally cross through them without actually seeing them. And, and I think that that's how we grow, not only as humans, but as business owners is by by recognizing that that's an opportunity for us to take. So do you think as you've been around the industry a long time, and I've always worked really hard to advise people and help them as best as I possibly can if they're embarking on that journey themselves that, you know, I've been knocked off the bike a few times and got back on and and tried to help people. Do you find that now that as a, a mentor figure, I guess, in in some respects, do you relish and enjoy that role that people ask you for for help and advice i always enjoyed that role that's never gone away um i don't know if i'm always the best person to ask uh, there are certainly more talented anglers out there than than i am and there's better conservationists and way better conservationists and there are better spokespeople um but from a business stance which is i'm i'm a pretty passionate business owner i'm always happy to offer advice uh, but it's been cool though, seeing anchored outdoors. Cause now the whole community is there to offer advice, uh, you know, the Facebook group and, but yeah, being a facilitator of, um, future careers has been, has been super fulfilling. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Tell me if somebody wants to, and I'm sure, like I've said before, if they have not listened to the podcast, how do they find it? And how do they find anchored outdoors too? Yeah. So you can find the podcast on Apple, Spotify, basically any of the pod- podcasting platforms. Um, for those of you who have an iPhone, there's a little purple podcast icon. You can find all sorts of fun podcasts in there, including my show and probably yours, Pete, I'm assuming. Yours is on yep. Apple. Yeah. Um, and then anchoredoutdoors.com. The website is currently being rebuilt as we speak. So excuse the mess that it is, but um, anchoredoutdoors.com. You can find the show there. There's a bunch of free content on there. And then of course, I'd love to have you, anyone listening, sign up to be a member. So if if you do that, or if you have any questions about that, you can just email me at april at anchoredoutdoors.com. Fantastic. April, it's been brilliant to catch up. We didn't do the 10 rods, but I don't, I think for me, certainly it's been a much more fascinating conversation to look down the timeline without using the rod. So thank you well, so much for I taking you, the time did, to talk with did, me. We did cover the rods because <laughs> that's all I've got. I've got my, I've got my graphite. I mean, I'm sorry, my um, glass Shakespeare, the bamboo rod from Wapley. And then the rod I use now is a Carrie Burkheimer, you know, just a beautiful classic stick. I really do. I'm not kidding. I have, I own 30 rods and I fish three of them. So that is truly my yeah. story of rods right there. There we go. April Vokey, my life in three fly rods. Um, April, it's been brilliant to catch up. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. 
Likewise. Thanks, Pete. Everyone, that has been the Fly Culture Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this edition of, of this one. As ever, there will be plenty more and keep listening. Thanks very much. The Fly Culture Podcast is brought to you in association with Fly Culture, a quarterly print magazine. For more information, please visit flyculturemag.com. You can also find Fly Culture on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter.